So we will be looking into HDB scan star. The H stands for hierarchical. And the star is kind of the revisited, or let's say, um, symmetric. And if you recall the B scan, there was this anomaly in the B scan that caused the results to be not perfectly deterministic. The result was deterministic on core points. It was deterministic on noise points. But it was not deterministic on border points because then it depended on the processing order unless we make multi-assignments. That is not that nice. And similar effects exist in, in optics. And that is not that cool, so we want to change this. So that is a continuation of this line of research and of these methods by one of the main authors, Jörg Sander. And we have nice properties, such as this, this definition that I introduced, what is a cluster? But then the algorithm did not perfectly fulfill this. We wanted to have this maximality. We cannot add more points to a cluster, and so the cluster needs to be maximal. And that was violated by the algorithm because of this problem of multi-border points. What if we get rid of the border points? Deterministic on core points, deterministic on noise points. No border points. Then we don't have this anomaly. Now the border points, they arose from using um, an asymmetric reachability. We saw this in the reachability definition of optics. What if we make the reachability, the density connectedness of points, symmetric? And we can do this, and they call this mutually direct reachable, where we simply use the maximum of the two core distances and the distance. Now, this is symmetric. I can rename A and B. It's the same. So by adding this additional term, we now have a symmetric version. And now, points are connected if they are core points and their distance is small enough. That's actually nicer. And now they also wanted to make this hierarchical and do it in a smarter way than with optics. So they decided, let's do a minimum spanning tree on this mutual reachability. So that is kind of like a single link clustering if we had a core size of one. But uh, it's a kind of a density linkage that we get. And then we get a dendrogram just as we've seen it on the previous slide. It looks pretty much the same. The problem is if we do it directly this way, we get a quadratic runtime to find this, to build this dendrogram. But we can accelerate this in, in different ways. Uh, for example, we can do, uh, use a minimum spanning tree algorithm that is called Burufka. That's a very early algorithm. It's about as old as Prim's algorithm. The main benefit of using this is Prim's algorithm processed one point at a time. Borufka's algorithm takes entire sets at once, finds like all closest pairs, merges them, repeats. It's a much more complicated algorithm this way. In particular, once you want to make this on trees, index trees for nearest neighbor search. It gets a, a pretty messy um, way of handing priority heaps and all of these candidates. So um, it is much harder to implement. 
Fortunately, there is a very nice implementation available in the HDB scan library for Python. So there exists a very good implementation of this accelerated technique, and that scales for, at least for Euclidean distances, to pretty large data sets, and that's cool. And it's a very popular clustering because of this good implementation. So if you're in research, it, it is kind of a prime example that it's not just enough to have a good idea. You have to have a good idea, you need to write a readable good paper on this, and you need to have a good implementation. Then you will have a lot of users and get a lot of citations. The, the other part they contributed, and that part is, in my opinion, as important, because so far this seems to be just like a minor variation. I'm like removing the asymmetry from DB scan and then doing this dendrogram. The other part they, they contributed is that they reconsidered how to get clusters from a dendrogram. This usual way of cutting a dendrogram at a certain height that would give us DB scan again with the symmetric version. So how do we pick, how do we cut subtrees in a dendrogram at varying heights? And they made an interesting observation that at a height less than the core distance, the point is noise for the algorithm. It, because it's not core, all the reachabilities are high. At some point epsilon, the point itself becomes a core point. And now it can begin to connect to others. And then, eventually, it will merge. And if a point merges into another cluster, it becomes a larger cluster. So one can argue that the point itself, the cluster represented by this point, disappears. So we have something called a lifetime. So clusters would begin to exist at some height, and they would cease to exist at a particular height. But if I'm working directly on a dendrogram, they all are very short-lived, because I'm always merging something. I'm always doing the next smallest merge. So the, this lifetime on a classic dendrogram is not that informative. But if I consider only merges of clusters, where both clusters have a minimum size. So if I'm adding a single point to a cluster, they call this spurious. That's a trivial change. That's not interesting. So adding single points or small groups of points, I don't care. But if I have 100 points and another 100 points, and these are merged into one cluster, that is an interesting change. And that's when, like, the old clusters cease to exist. They live on if I'm adding single points, but if I make a large merge, the old cluster cease to exist and a new cluster begins at this point. And I can define, like, a minimum and a maximum radius at which this happens. So, Epsilon min will usually be the first time a one-point cluster, it begins to live, and then eventually it merges, then it ceases to exist, and then a new one begins. That's the epsilon min of the top, the parent cluster. And then you have the idea of a lifetime, which is how long does this cluster exist. And a cluster that exists longer is stable. If I would randomly be randomly guessing the epsilon, I'm more likely to observe this cluster if it exists for a large range of epsilon. So that is a stable, a reliable cluster. So that's what I want to find. Now, the problem is the, the cluster still changes across the lifetime. These small objects get added. So I need also to discuss the lifetime of each object and aggregate this for a cluster. And I can define the appearance of an object X in a cluster C 
as the maximum of the core distance of that point C, that, which is when the point becomes a core itself, and the minimum when a cluster begins to exist by merging. And they had this nice, interesting idea to find such interest-stable clusters. They called it the excess of mass. If this is like my density landscape, in the very bottom, I have noise. That is pretty uninteresting. Low density areas are noise. I have this bottom air. But if I would move my epsilon to this height, the cluster would split into two parts. Now, this peak over here is pretty large. That is interesting. This part here is also pretty large. That's also interesting. So this, I might want to find this. This is maybe part of the clustering that I want to find. And I can try to quantify this. I can argue that the area over here, the excess of mass when moving above the critical value, uh, plus the area over here, this is quite some big area compared to what I have in the bottom. So that is an improvement to consider the part above. Now I might have, might also consider this point. Here my old cluster is this yellow area and my resulting new clusters of splitting it are these two smaller peaks. That is maybe a too small excess mass that I get. So by only, by cutting here, I have this uh, less information kind of, less density. So in this case, I might want to cut my data only at one height. Now, how can I put this into equations? How can I compute this? Well, I need, for, for the intuition, I need to talk about density and not about radius, radius, epsilon. So instead of using epsilon, they used the uh, inverse, multiplicative inverse. They called it lambda. So my maximum epsilon becomes a minimum density when a cluster begins to exist. My minimum density um, becomes a maximum when it ceases to. And the idea is I want to make an integral over this area. So of my mi maximum minus my minimum density over all my data. But we are on a sample here. We are not looking at probability distributions in a parametric modeling, but we are working with data. So instead of doing this integral, what they do is a sum over all data points. And the data point has a maximum density and it has a minimum density of the cluster and I can take the difference of them. Now I can substitute back the definition of density to go to my radius, which is what I've been working with. So I put these in here. And this way I can compute a value that is called the cluster stability. And now I have to make some tricks to do the actual cluster extraction. I have to do this bottom up and then top down, but um, nothing very fair. Uh, difficult happening here. The, the idea is if the sum of my children's stabilities is larger than the stability of the parent, then I want to keep the children. If the parent is more stable because it's long lived, then I want to keep the parent and not the children. And then this way I can extract interesting clusters from this type of density dendrogram. It won't work on arbitrary dendrograms because, of course, I'm using 
the, the densities in here that I don't have if I do single link or complete link or average link. So that is the key idea of HDB scan. An HDB scan is definitely the go-to method for density-based clustering nowadays. It revisited and improved key decisions from the DB scan and the optics method and solved this in a much nicer way. And we have a good implementation that gives a comparable performance. Okay, that's it for today. Sorry for being slightly over time.